Hello, and welcome to this short video primer on the rhetorical triangle, a fundamental concept of communication that has been around for centuries, originating with Aristotle in ancient Greece. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Aristotle, ancient Greece, rhetoric? I did not sign up for this class. And no, you did not. You signed up for a class on business and professional writing. Fortunately, though, these concepts endure and have relevance for all of our communications, whether our everyday communications on the street or our workplace communications that involve writing, speaking, uh, creating materials, all of those things. So in this presentation, I'll look to show you how these concepts remain relevant to the work that you do and why they still should matter to us today. So to get started, what is the rhetorical triangle? Why is it called a triangle? Well, it's mainly called a triangle because it has three elements, each of which represents a point or corner of a triangle. And those three essential elements represent our tools or means of persuading others. And those means of persuasion include ethos, pathos, and logos. And by understanding and balancing these interconnected components, you can craft persuasive and impactful messages. Odds are you're already doing this. You're already using ethos, pathos, and logos to do this on a daily basis. We're just putting definition and language and terms to concepts you're likely already very familiar with. So what is ethos? Ethos is about building the speaker's credibility, authority, and trustworthiness. And we'll look at a few examples of how to do that in this presentation. And then we have pathos or pathos, depending on if you're hearing it pronounced in American English or British English. And this is where we appeal to the audience's emotions and work to create an emotional connection with our audience. And then we have logos. And this is where we present logical reasoning, facts, and evidence to support our arguments. All of these come together and work together to create persuasive messages. Depending on the context of your message, you might need to lean on one means more heavily than the others, but often our persuasive communications involve a balance of all three. So to begin, ethos, establishing credibility. This is where one, in the expertise domain, we demonstrate in-depth knowledge and experience on a topic. So for example, if I'm addressing a room of educators, I might start by saying, in my 20 years experience teaching in higher education, it's been my experience that my students are motivated by A, B, and C. So I'm prefacing or I'm starting my speech by mentioning how long I've worked in higher education and showing that I do have some expertise there. Another way that I see a lot of people demonstrate expertise, particularly in academic settings, is showing that they have a breadth of knowledge in a topic. So it's not just about depth, but it's about breadth, that I'm aware of varying perspectives that come into play on a given topic, and that I'm not just taking one perspective and running with it, that I've done the research and I have the expertise to speak confidently about this particular subject. And then we have integrity, and this is where we convey honesty, sincerity, and adherence to ethical principles. So what does that look like? Well, in the case of academic settings, which we're in right now, oftentimes you'll hear talk of academic integrity. And academic integrity is often measured by our citation of sources, so that when we're writing a paper, we are citing sources and attributing our ideas to where they found their origin, as opposed to just acting like we came up with all the ideas ourselves. And in doing so, we're proceeding with integrity and in conveying honesty in our communication. And then three is goodwill. So this is showing concern for the audience interests and well-being. You can really establish credibility that way as opposed to coming into a room, not knowing anything about your audience, and then potentially not even addressing their interests or concerns at all. And that's not a great way to establish rapport or credibility. So all of these things are examples, of course, there are more examples of how we do this. I encourage you to think about how you see this done in your workplace communications and in just general and professional environments. And moving on, next up, we have pathos or pathos. And this is where we appeal to emotion. So let's talk about 
what do we do? What are some tools that we have for appealing to emotions? Well, one tool we have is storytelling. So for instance, let's say you're writing about something um, to a group of people about the wildfires in Paradise, California, and how this has affected the community and um, how we may come in to help that community. Now, you could start by presenting just the cold and hard facts that statistically, this is how many people were impacted by the wildfires. This is what that looked like for them. But another way to, to go about this is to actually narrow in on an individual's experience. So rather than presenting the general statistics, which you can do, but also maybe think about presenting an actual story or the lived experience of an actual person. So you might, for instance, find someone named Monica who was impacted by the wildfires in Paradise, California, and really focus in on how those wildfires impacted Monica in her life so that your audience can start to think about, well, what if this happened to me? What if I were Monica in this situation? How would I feel? What would I do? So it's a great way to get them to connect to the heart of the story, as opposed to just looking at it as these you know, distant kind of statistics. Another way that we appeal to emotions is through vivid language. And a lot of times when we think of vivid language, we do so with a nod to our senses, right? So sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch, all of those things. We use vivid language to bring our subject matter to life so that people can connect with it on a level different from just written words on a page. So for instance, let's say that I'm providing something written about um, trying to preserve a pine forest. Well, rather than just say, you know, pine trees smell good, they remind me of my youth, I might start out with something a little more robust in the vivid language department. So I might start with saying something like with the fresh smell of pine and the damp soil, these I'm reminded of my youth where I used to go hiking with my father. So you're bringing in that human experience and inviting people into a rich and lively atmosphere of your own experience, as opposed to just, you know, putting things on the page. So that's vivid language, language that connects to our senses and invites people to inhabit our experience or the experience that we're trying to get across. And then shared experiences. So this is tapping into an audience's shared values, beliefs, and life experiences. So this is where a lot of audience research can come into play so that when you're directing communications to a particular audience, you might have some knowledge about them and what it is that their values are, their beliefs are, and then you appeal to those values and beliefs in your writing. Not in a way that's gross or inauthentic, but in a way that's sincere and is about connecting with humans through shared experience. And then we have logos, and this is our logical reasoning. This is where we talk about data or data coming into play. So presenting relevant statistic, facts, and empirical evidence. So you're not just picking your arguments out of the air, you're actually showing not only am I presenting this argument, but I can back up this argument with real data. Um, also reasoning, using sound logic, valid arguments, and clear explanations. And structure, organizing the message in a clear, coherent, and logical manner. So think back to elementary school when you were first learning writing structures. And you maybe were presented with the five paragraph essay. I know that I was. The five paragraph essay starts with an introduction. It has your body paragraphs and it has your conclusion. And you connect all of these puzzle pieces of the essay with transition words like next and finally in conclusion. This is a way of making sure that the different pieces of our writing stick together coherently and make sense. We're showing how these different parts of this this essay connect and, um, and what they mean. Now, there are, of course, far more structures than the five-paragraph essay. Usually in higher education, we begin to move away from that five-paragraph essay. But that's one that I find is a good kind of common point of understanding for people to think about how structure itself contributes to logical reasoning and the appeal of logos. And then just to consider kind of overall the enduring relevance of the rhetorical triangle or ethos, pathos, and logos, 
these are timeless principles. So hopefully from this video, you've gleaned that just because they originated in ancient Greece doesn't mean we're not still using them in our day-to-day -day communication. We actually use them rather heavily. Um, and they're relevant across cultures and eras. Adaptability. Now, as we've looked at some examples, these particular appeals can be applied to a wide range of communication contexts, from public speaking to marketing. And then empowerment. Understanding the rhetorical triangle equips us with a new way of kind of thinking about how we engage and persuade audiences. So as I mentioned at the start of this video, you've likely been employing these elements of persuasion your entire life, but by putting a name to them and thinking of concrete examples of how they're used, you can then think about them as tools that as you write, you sit down with your writing and you say, where does ethos come into play? Where is pathos coming into play? Where is logos coming into play? And they can really, again, just empower you to be ever more persuasive and convincing in your writing. So that's it for the rhetorical triangle. Thank you for your attention and happy communicating.